Hello everyone. And it's been a while, I think, since I've done this about a week or so. Let's check the mic. All right, the mic sounds good. And uh, so, let's quickly get into it. Uh, so, kind of will be from Hebrews chapter eight. And uh, someone, this started from, uh, this started about when someone asked me to read and explain the Bible. I tried, I'll tell you what, um, I've got great respect for pastors a little bit often now. <laughs> it does, it takes a lot to uh, trying to preach the Bible verse by verse. Um, but yeah, so this is from Hebrews chapter eight. Um, it's been said you need to study the Bible for 40 hours a, a, a week or something, but nevertheless, um, so what do we, um, know a little bit about the book of Hebrews before we get into it? Um, uh, this epistle was written to Jews living in Palestine. They were converts from preaching of the apostles, as seen in the book of Acts. You see them uh, uh, preaching to the Jews and believing. They were uh, the... Hold on a second, just... Yeah. And um, they were they were um, the Jews living in the Book of Acts. Uh, I think yeah, in Jerusalem, I believe it was. So this possibly was written to the people in Jerusalem, the Book of Hebrews or Epistle. Um, that also doesn't seem to want them to go back to Judaism. Hence, the explanation of Christ fulfilling the practices of the Old Testament, and that's really important. Um, that Christ has fulfilled the Old Testament rituals. It's about how the New Testament points to the Old Testament as fulfillment and the Old Testament points to the New as practices are symbols of Christ, as we've said before. What time is it over here? Well, it's almost midnight. It, it, it's better this way. <laughs> Because I do things during the day and stuff, but um, and um, anyway, um, so the themes or in the book of Hebrews or the epistle of to the Hebrews, um, is basically Christ, really. Um, uh, it's about the supremacy of the Son of God, who is superior to the angels. That's Hebrews chapter one. Uh, the New Covenant, uh, the book of Hebrews teaches about a new covenant and it's mentioned 17 times uh, and it's mentioned in chapters 8 and 9. So um, that's what you expect when you don't want, when it's the authors trying to explain uh, the Old Testament practices and it's fulfilled in Christ and he's trying to explain it to the Jews. Um, Christ is greater than Moses. That's Hebrews chapter 3. Christ is the media of a new and better covenant. Uh, that's Hebrews 7, 22 and 12, 24. Christ is the priest or high priest. Hebrews chapters 5 and 7. Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. Christ entered into the holy place. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 10. 
Yes, that, that's amazing, Theophilus. Um, how God makes things and we're different countries and um, different uh, and countries and stuff. But um, before we get into Hebrews chapter 8, let's get to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22 to 28. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, why don't you uh, grab them and uh, if you like, read along with me. And then after uh, I explain all this or attempt to, I uh, will be question and answer. And that doesn't have to be relevant to Hebrews chapter 8. It can be any question and answers. So, verse 22 to 28 says this. Uh, this is from the ESV. This makes Jesus the guarantee, guarantor of a better covenant. And we'll see this in the next chapter. So this is a bit of a context, what Hebrews 8 is all about. Um, and it's important when you're reading the Bible to have a bit of context. Uh, if you're going to read uh, Ephesians chapter 2, you read uh, Ephesians 1. And even possibly oh, Hebrews. Um, if you're going to read Ephesians chapter 2, read Ephesians chapter 1. And possibly even chapter three, even the understanding of the whole epistle, uh, the history of it a little bit. So I'm no expert at it, but I may upload one from a pastor and how pastors do it. So I'm wanting to learn how pastors do it. So when I uh, engage with other people, I want to faithfully, rightly handle the word of God uh, accurately. And when I'm speaking, Speaking to when I when I disagree with someone to prove to them that's not what the passage is saying. Um, but anyway, so verse twenty three: the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. There you go, and we will see that Christ uh, continues on forever. So the priests of the Old Testament uh, were limited because of death continuing in office um jesus who is the great high priest he he never he uh will continually on uh be the high priest so there's a comparison there, and it always is a comparison um on old and the new testament and what christ has fulfilled and uh, verse 24 but he holds his priesthood permanently there it is uh because he continues forever exactly right so we don't need a high priest anymore. Jesus uh, has fulfilled that, and we'll look at a little bit later on what Christ has fulfilled and the difference between old and new covenant. Consequently, verse 25, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Uh, for them, he's referring to uh, the elect, his people. And um, Verse 26, for it was intended fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. So uh, so this high priest, which is Jesus Christ, he's holy. That means uh, he is separate. Uh, it's been said that holy means separate. Um, you could also say it's in a way that Christ is without sin and we are. We don't know uh, what it's truly to be in the presence of a holy man. It's been said before the Pope is, they call him his holiness. No, not not real, not at all. Um, he's nothing like God. Um, but nevertheless, um, innocent, Jesus without sin, unstained. That's kind of similar again. Uh, separated from sinners. He's not like sinners, as I said different ways of explaining uh, the terms here. Exalted above the heavens, it says. Indeed, he is, verse 27, he has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, for first for his own sins, then for those of the people. So that's talking not all people, but for the people. Since he did this once for all, when he offered up himself, for the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later, 
then the law appoints a son who has made per- has been made perfect forever. So Christ is, and here's something interesting, Christ fulfills the high priest and the sacrifice, the lamb. So Jesus, the high priest, and he's the lamb of God that takes the sin, takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the sacrifice and the high priest, which is a really interesting comparison. So Jesus fulfills many other things, as you will see. So... Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, uh, the title is Jesus, the high priest of a better covenant. The old covenant is old and it's made obsolete, uh, as the writer of Hebrews says here. Um, and it says, now, the point in which we are saying this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated above the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. That's verse one, and so we says so we see here. Uh, the now is referring to what he said before and connecting to what he's going to say in the coming verses. So, when someone says the word now, there is a meaning for for it. Uh, that is to say, he says now. He's is kind of saying. Okay, now he, he kind of finished a sentence before it. So when he when someone says now and or the apostle Paul have said it a few times, but now or but there's got to be a reason why he said that. So we read verses before it for better context, um, and that's why it's important um, to read verses before. And this is why context is important. If you're talking about something and someone just enters a conversation um, for for them to get a good understanding the what you are saying that they need to hear the what you said before not just a few uh, a few minutes in uh, not a few minutes later actually it's important context is important Um, that's why it's important like I said to read the chapter or chapters before it and some, as it's been said, and it's this is one of the key interpretation of in, uh, the key method of interpreting scripture is scripture interprets scripture. Uh, like we've seen here, that the author of Hebrews pointing to the old, and he's saying Christ has fulfilled the high priest. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Um, so there's something to think about there, and it says that. He sat down at the right hand, which is a reference of power or even favor. Um, So let's look at these two passages um, before we move on to understand why uh, it's important because it says Jesus sat down the right hand. Uh, this means power or favor. Um, it's been said, Matthew 24, 22, 44, this is what Jesus says, or actually it's a quote from the Old Testament. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and learn to put your enemies under your feet. So once again, uh, this is God referring to uh, his son. Uh, Jesus. He's t- talking to Jesus. Uh, sit at my right hand. That's a that's favor or power. So the Son of God, the Messiah, has got has favor on him by the Father, and is in power. And so Matthew twenty six forty four it says, so leaving them, he went away and prayed for the third time. What what what, what did I put out one in? <laughs> no, I think I this is. Uh, Right hand of power, I can just type it in. Uh, Right hand of... Type in right hand in Google uh, Bible Gateway. uh, And it says, Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. Um, Who It is I who say to you, fear not, for I am the one who helps you. Um, Another one, what is that passage that I wanted to... Uh, where is it? And here's another one, 2244. 
And now that's, yeah, I think this is the one I probably wanted to say. Actually, this is the one, uh, 2664, Matthew 2664. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you'll see the Son of Man seated at right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You see, this Jesus is uh, the favored one and he has power. So right hand means you have favor with someone, obviously from God, or you have power. And Jesus says so himself in Matthew 26, 64, seated at the right hand of power. Um, that's what it means. Um, also, uh, well, let's go on with Hebrews. Um, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So the Lord has sent up, uh, put up this tent, this uh, holy place, not man. Uh, verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is, it is necessary for this priest to also have something to offer. And so seated is an important reference because uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 to 12 says this. It says, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat at the right hand of God. There it is again. He's at the right hand of God, uh, right hand of power. Um, so it says that the priest uh, stands daily. And you know what? This is important reference. Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, and the priest stands daily. It's been said that the priest never sat down uh, when he was in the Holy of Holies. I believe that's in the book of Leviticus. But you know what? Since Jesus sat down, his atonement has been finished. So he is seated. So once again, the comparison, the priest in Leviticus, and I think in the other books as well, stands uh, continually because his work is not finished. He has to offer sacrifices daily, as it's been said there. Uh, he the priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But Christ, who is God incarnate, had offered for all time a single sacrifice. He sat down the right hand of God. So the priest uh, could not sit down because his work was not finished. He had to continually offer sacrifices. Jesus, uh, who sacrificed himself for sins once for all, sat down around the right hand of God because his work is finished. His work of atonement is finished. That's why Jesus said in John 19, verse 30 to 31, it is finished. So this is really important. Jesus' atonement is finished. Uh, Ellen White has said his atonement is not finished, which is a false teaching. Um, so that's really important there. So once you get into the details of it, it's interesting how Christ has fulfilled it, that the priest stands daily because he offers sacrifice continually. It's never finished. And Jesus sits down at the right hand of God because his atonement is finished. He sacrificed himself once and for all. So there's the comparison there. Um, and verse 2 uh, relates to verse 5. Priests were earthly sanctuary, meaning the priest would not last forever. But Christ is the heavenly meaning that his priest lasts forever, as I said before. Um, verse 3 states, is, so verse 3, what? Does this priest, which is Christ, has to offer? Christ offer, was offering himself, Hebrews 7.27, his own blood, uh, Hebrews 9.12, his body, uh, Hebrews 10.10. 10. We see here that Christ is both the priest and the sacrifice. As I said before, he fulfills both roles. 
and he fulfills many roles. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John 1.29. The offering that had to be without blemish, Leviticus 3.6. It says there that the Lamb had to be without blemish. Christ is without blemish, Hebrews 9.14. Meaning he's without sin, Hebrews 4.15. You cannot have a sacrifice without sin, which means the sacrifice will not be clean. Uh, this is why it is very important that Christ had to be God. You cannot, and I cannot stress this enough, you cannot have a perfect human sacrifice despite what people say. You would have a perfect human being, which is impossible. Uh, because if one is a human, he would be a sinner. sinner Romans 3.23 so there's there's a problem there. People who reject Jesus as God have a huge, huge problem. This is why Jesus had to be God. Uh, we trust in Christ for salvation. You cannot trust a me human for salvation. Um, hold on a second. I'm going to get a drink of water. This is why it's really important. If Christ is not God, then you're putting your trust in the mere human being. This cannot work at all. It's a false Jesus. If Jesus is not God, it's a false false teaching. He's both true God and true man. This is why it's important uh, to get who Christ is right. Um, because a mere human cannot op offer up himself if he's not God. If he's not God, then he's a sinner. You can have a perfect human being. This just does not make sense at all. And some of the cults say this. Um, Iglesia and Christo say that. And then you have a problem of the um, mediator, behalf of God and man. Yeah, Jesus is a man who's working on behalf of man, but he's not God. So who's working on the behalf of God? This is why Jesus must be true man, true God, because he's mediating on the behalf of God, because he's God, and he's mediating behalf of man, because he's man. Think about this. you got a fight between two friends. Some you cannot have a strain a friend of one friend but not of the other because you you try to uh, get a reconciliation uh, to happen. One will say, "Hey mate, how's it going?" You know your friend, but the other one say, "Who are you? I don't know you." <laughs> you know, um, so you must have a mutual friend in between both friends. So he's trying to cause a reconciliation, a get together of the friends. So if Jesus is just man and not God, then God, you have a problem. You still have the problem. It's like a halfway bridge. Jesus is man, yes, but he's not God. Then the bridge is halfway, not not 100% across. Jesus is true God and true man. Therefore, the bridge is right across the cliff, if you've probably seen that. So this is why it's really, well, it's essential to believe that Jesus is God. <clears throat> um, so this is why uh, Christ kept the law perfectly. A sinner cannot do that. Uh, he obeyed and loved God perfectly with heart, soul, mind, and strength, which was imputed to us. So here's the thing. Uh, if Christ uh, disobeyed God's law just once, he'd be dis disqualified as a perfect savior. This is why they say, yeah, people who reject Jesus as God, they say, we believe he's without sin, but he's not God. Well, if he's human, then he's a sinner. But he's, if he's a sinner, then you have a huge problem because Christ kept the law perfectly, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this is why double imputation is really important. And I might do a live stream podcast on this later on, Lord willing. Um, as R.C. Sproul said, not only did Christ die for us, he lived for us. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, because we, we fail to do this daily. Um, no one can love the Lord, their God, with heart, their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We fail to do it, but Christ did it perfectly. Um, so when this is I'll quickly just explain double imputation a little bit. Double imputation is I give Christ, uh, God gives Christ my sin, and Christ was treated uh, guilty, although he was innocent. Christ was treated as though, although he was a sin, treated as though he was a sinner, although he was without sin. And uh, God gives me His perfect robe of righteousness, so I'm declared righteous by faith alone. I'm declared, I'm justified by faith alone. So 
I am clothed with the righteousness of Christ. God sees me uh, righteous, although I'm a sinner. I deserve hell, but God gives me heaven and gives me the gift of his righteousness. And it's nothing that I've done. Uh, this is the perfect Bible verse, and there's many. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So that's really important. I encourage you to study this. Um, verse 6, uh, actually, let's go into this. Um, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See you that you have made everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Um, yes. And verse 6. But it is Christ who has obtained a ministry, that it is as much as more excellent than the old, as the covenant mediates, mediates is better, since it is enacted. En enacted. <laughs> on better promises for if that the first covenant had been faultless there would have no have been no occasion for a look for a second um as we saw in hebrews 722 christ is the mediator of a better covenant um and this is uh continuing on verses 8 to 12 which is a quote from jeremiah 31 and this is what it states, for he finds fault in them when he says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant I will make the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds, Write them on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor, each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. For the least of them to the greatest, I will be their merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So that's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. Uh, that's scripture. Uh, quoting scripture, um, once again, uh, that's one of the key principles of hermeneutics or interpretation, that uh, when scripture interprets scripture, it's God's word quoting God's word. So we must understand why is this happening, what, a, what is the motivation, um, and yeah, so, and that's the only commentary uh, that is infallible, that is perfect, that is without error, that God's word uh, quotes God's word. So the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Um, so we see here, uh, the old law was changed due to the coming of Christ. We see scripture, interpret scripture. Um, when something is writing, God breathed scripture and quotes, interprets God breathed scripture, which makes infallible commentary on scripture. We should listen to very carefully, um, like I said. And it's from Jeremiah, verse, like I said, chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. Um, verse 10, laws on their minds. The law of sacrifice couldn't and didn't take away sin. It's Christ's death that cleanses the conscience. Hebrews 9, 9 to 14. Uh, which is really important uh, there. Um, once again, Christ is fulfilling something there. Verse 11, shall know me. This means that under the old covenant or the old law, the presence was restricted with the Holy of Holies. God was unapproachable because God is holy. But Christ, um, who tore the veil, and now we go to God, we approach God, we can approach God where the Old Testament people weren't, weren't able to approach God. We approach God through Jesus Christ, uh, who tore the veil. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so, and verse 13, in speaking of the new covenant, he 
makes the first one obsolete and that is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Verse 13 is speaking of a new covenant. He makes one obsolete. Mediates a new and better covenant once again. Hebrews 7.22 um, So to understand a little bit of the uh, old covenant and new covenant, here's something to think about and to read if you like. Um, this is the law and gospel. The old covenant is a bit like do, do, do. And the gospel is grace, what Christ has done. Um, so here's something to think about. Uh, the old law, old covenant, uh, the law says do, but it's been done. Romans 4.15. Let's go to Romans 4.15. And this is what it says. For the law brings wrath, but there is no law. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the, the law brings wrath. We fail to keep it. So we keep on do, do, do to keep the law, but we fail. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, Moses and Christ, John 1, 16. This is interesting. Um, uh, it says this, for, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Uh, hold on a second, is it 15? Or, or is it 17? John got 12 mentions of Moses. Uh, John 1 17 it says this for the law was given through Moses grace and truth came through Jesus Christ so law was given through Moses always do 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 but through Christ grace has been grace and truth came through Christ so in the old covenant with you must do 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 in the, in the new covenant New Testament is promoted uh, grace unmerited favor because of christ's death this doesn't mean that there is full of do do do's in old testament but there is uh prophecies pointing to the new testament what was to come um so and so mount sinai and the cross there's the similarities here but the the grace bit is unmerited favor we don't need to do 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 it's already been done, Christ's death on the cross. Um, my efforts and Christ's efforts. My efforts, I'm not saved by my efforts. I'm saved by Christ's efforts. Christ gets the glory because of his finished atonement upon the, upon the cross. Um, curse and blessings. Um, so like I said, Romans 4.15, uh, it brings wrath. If you, you fail to keep it, this is why it's important. Um, for those who wanted to keep the uh, Sabbath, that's Old Covenant. You failed to keep the Sabbath perfectly. The Sabbath was pointing to Christ. It's basically a burden um, on you instead of a blessing. Christ is the uh, Lord of the Sabbath. He's our rest. Uh, and it's a blessing. Uh, God's commands and blessings. And so... Moving on to the next um, theme, you could say, a comparison on how what Christ fulfilled, signs pointing him to to him, the old covenant. Christ is the sacrifice, Lamb of God without blemish. Christ is the high priest. Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath and our rest. So something to read here from Calvin's commentary, uh, Exodus 20, verse 8. It says this, Wherefore, it must be concluded that the substance of the Sabbath, which Paul declares to be in Christ, okay, that's something interesting, that the substance of the Sabbath is in Christ. Uh, this is from uh, Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, the substance is in Christ. You cannot keep the Sabbath, uh, the Jewish Sabbath, and claim to follow uh, and believe Christ is your rest and your Sabbath, because there's a problem. It's either one or the other. If the substance is in Christ, then 
you don't need to keep this uh, Sabbath because the Sabbath was pointing to Christ. Like I said, Christ fulfills everything in the old. Since Christ is our high priest, we don't need a high priest anymore. Since Christ is the Lamb of God, is a sacrifice, we don't need to do sacrifice anymore. Since Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath, our rest is in him, we don't need to keep the Jewish Sabbath. Christ is the substance. It's like uh, you you got a spouse. You're waiting for your spouse to come home, but you're looking at the picture. Uh, the picture is the shadow. And when the, the spouse comes home, you you welcome them. The, the substance is here. You don't need the photo anymore. You're, you're, the actual substance is here. So it, it is with Christ. Uh, the Sabbath was pointing to Christ. It was a shadow, like a bit of a shadow. The shadow is not the real thing, but the actual thing that's making the shadow, that's the real substance. So that's the same picture or analogy uh, is. So the sh sh Sabbath is a shadow. Um, and Christ is the substance. Christ is here. We don't need to keep the Sabbath because Christ is uh, our Sabbath rest. We rest in him. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. Um, it's all in Christ. You cannot be in the new covenant and keep the Jewish Sabbath because it's do, do, do. That's law. Um, anyway. Uh, Calvin goes on, must have been no ordinary good thing. Nor does uh, so, uh, so it's well, I'm trying to uh, it says the the Calvin says the apostle in the epistle of the Hebrews argues more stup substitutely that the true rest is brought to us by the gospel. Exactly, the true rest is brought to us in the gospel because of Christ's atonement. It's in Christ. Uh, the old covenant people did not have Christ. Um, they did not have Christ's atonement. Um, that is rejected by unbelief. Uh, Hebrews 4.3. Um, we cannot... Uh, let's, it says here that the... I'm just reading here. Um, and it says here, Calvin goes on, he says, This is emptying out of self must proceed so far that the Sabbath is violated even by good works. So long as we regard them as our own, for rightly does Augustine remark, uh, for even our good works themselves, since they are understood to be rather his than ours, imputed to, the, imputed to us for the attaining of the Sabbath, when we are still and he is God. Um, so the, when you always focus on doing, doing, you kind of lose the focus. You're not exactly focused on Christ. You're focusing on what you can and cannot do. It becomes a burden. Um, and Calvin goes on, I think, uh, although this is sufficiently plain, still it will be worth well to confirm Further statements, and first of all, that this was a ceremonial precept. Paul clearly teaches, calling it a shadow of these things. There it is, the body of which is only Christ. So if, once again, as a shadow, we don't want a shadow. We want the real thing. Uh, Colossians 2.17, but if the outward rest was nothing but a ceremony, the substance which must be sought in Christ and remains considered how Christ actually exhibited and how was then prefigured, and the same apostle declares when he states, Our old man is crucified with Christ, and that we are buried with him, and his resurrection may be newness to life. So if we keep the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, but not, uh, and not rest in Christ, we're making Christ, it is like Christ is empty. Why are you keeping the Sabbath when our true rest is in Christ? It's rest in the gospel. You cannot rest in Christ and rest in the truth. Jewish Sabbath. Um, and then Colossians 2.17, commentary by Calvin, uh, which are a shadow of things to come. The reason why he frees Christians from the observance of them is they were shadows at a time when Christ was still in a manner absent. Uh, so there it is, Old Testament Jewish observance of the Sabbath because Christ was not there at that time. For he contrasts shadows with revelation, absence with manifestation. 
uh, those therefore still adhere to those shadows, Aquap, those who should judge of a man's appearance from his shadow. Um, the body says he that is of Christ is in Christ for substance of those which ceremonies act anciently prefigured is now present before our eyes in Christ inasmuch as he contains himself everything that they marked out as future. Hence, man that calls back the ceremonies into use, listen to this, if you're going to call back the ceremonies into use, either buries the manifestation of Christ or Christ or robs Christ of his excellence and makes him a manner void. Listen to that. That's really interesting. If you want to call back the old covenant, Old Testament ceremonies, you're burying the manifestation manifestation of Christ or rob Christ of his excellence, making him making the, makes him a, in the manner void. So if you're keeping the Old Testament uh, rituals, you're making Christ of making him nothing almost. You're keeping the shadows when the substance is here. Why are you doing that? I've had a chat with people who promote that and do that, and that's sadly called Judaizers. That's a false teaching, really. That's what the book of Galatians is all about. Um, that That's why it's really important. Like, if you want to uh, st study into this, um, study the book of Hebrews and the book of Galatians. Um, don't, don't listen to me on this, although I'm just uh, trying to explain it. I'm not the best at it, but listen to preaching or read commentaries on it. Um, why don't we keep the uh, the festivals or the moons or uh, the Passover? I had a chat with one woman who said she's keeping the Passover of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. But Jesus is a Passover lamb. We don't need to keep the Old Testament Passover. But the Passover of the Old Testament, Exodus, was prefiguring, was a sign and pointing to Christ. And Jesus instituted he, that he is the Passover lamb, that his uh, blood would be shed and his uh, flesh would be broken, his body would be broken. So this is the problem. If you're pointing to the old, if you're wanting to be an the old, then you're making Christ of nothing. And this would be a dangerous false teaching that might not make you Christian if at all. You, I hope you see what I'm saying here, that if you keep the old covenant rituals, Old Testament rituals, you're making Christ of no effect. Um, there's commentaries by Ignatius of Antioch who says, if you're going back to Judaism rituals and ceremonies, then you cannot really say you believe in Christ because it's like you're, Jew you, you're basically going back to going back to Judaism and you say you believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't work. Everything in the Old Testament, the ceremonies, the Sabbath, it's all fulfilled in Christ. Um, and that's what is Calvin saying here. Um, and that's really important. He said, I'll repeat this again. Hence, the man that calls back the ceremonies into use, if you're going to put the Old Covenant rituals, ceremonies into use, either bears a manifestation of Christ or robs Christ of his excellence. You don't know how excellent Christ is if you're wanting to keep the ceremonies of the Old Covenant, Old Testament, and makes him a man of void. Okay? Um, and go on. Calvin goes on, according to... Should any of the mortals assume to himself the matter of the, uh, um, yeah, Christ is the complete competent judge, sets us free. Um, yeah, so that that's really important. So Calvin goes on, um, yeah, that that is a part of man meant to take hold of empty shadows. So once again, why? Why you keep? Why are you wanting to take hold of empty shadows? Like once again, you look at a building, you see a shadow. It's like someone pointing at the shadow of the building. Wow, look at that shadow. That's amazing. Look how beautiful it is when the actual building is much more. If that's the real thing, that's the substance. When the actual building is much more beautiful, it's the real substance. Why are you taking hold of the empty shadow? Why are you? Why are you focusing on something that's not as important when Christ is the most important? Uh, is this real substance? Um, when it goes on, Calvin, when it's in his power to handle the solid substance, exactly. Why are you looking to the 
shadow when you can handle the solid substance. Christ is the substance. Um, and so, yeah, Christ is there for us to be enjoyed. He's amazing. He's 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 our priest. He's the Lamb of God. Um, they are not there for bare shadows, but the contrary symbols of Christ's presence, for they contain, yea, amen, promises God, 2 Corinthians one twenty, and has been once manifested to us in Christ. And so in finishing, and those who want to ask questions, if you have got any, any questions at all, not just to this, but anything in general, Christ tore the veil. Uh, as I said before, 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 16. And we'll read this. Get your questions ready if you have any. It says this, but their minds were hardened for to this day. When they read the Old Covenant, the, the, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is taken away. Yes, this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So we see something here that man uh, who's following the old covenant, you could say, uh, when they read the old covenant, the same the same veil remains unlifted. So man is unable to see this. The same as this is basically total depravity. Man is blinded here. He has a veil. Over him, he cannot see it. It remains unlifted because only through Christ is taken away. So only God can take away that veil. Um, so, when, so this is a danger thing here. Those who are in the old covenant, who are keeping old uh, the ceremonies of the covenant, they have a veil that is unlifted. Um, and I believe Paul here is talking about the Jews, but nevertheless, it's the same for those. Uh, who want to keep the old covenant ceremonies? Um, because you've got to understand, Christ is the substance; He's fulfilled it. He's the Sabbath rest, Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lamb of God. He's the sacrifice. He's the High Priest. He, he is it all. Um, so to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Once again, Christ has got to take away the veil, or God. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And so well, last one, Christ is the mediator. Uh, 8, 6, Hebrews 8, 6, 9, 15, and 12, 24. And that's important there. So if anyone, if anyone has any questions at all, you can join in the chat. How long have I been going for? Oh, 47 minutes. Okay. If anyone has a question at all, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be this. Uh, I can give the link if you want to ask me an audio question or you can uh, ask me a question in the chat section there. Um, if no one has any questions, then I will hit the hay here in Australia. So anyone at all <laughs> wanting to ask a question. Uh, I will answer it to the best of my ability. If anyone's wanting to. Uh, by the way, my uh, the video that I put up by Pastor Matthew Everhard, if that is his real name, surname, I doubt it. Uh, what's the deal with predestination? Is doing quite well. Um, anyone? Anyone's got a question? If not, then I will hit the hay. Uh, thank you, Raymond Fields. Uh, it's, it's humbling that anyone enjoys listening to me. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, last time, anyone's got questions? If not, then I will finish this uh, live stream. Thank you guys for the encouragement. No one? No one's got questions? 
no one at all anything about this or I'm sure if someone would have a question they'll comment in the comment section so um yeah so no one's got questions then um anyway thanks for listening guys uh listening to me rant um if you would like a commentary on the book of hebrews um there, there's some good ones obviously there's free or free ones from john calvin um there's one for uh, oh well there's one if you know okay oh there's one peggy's got one thank you peggy um so every is every day a sabbath um I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on this one, but you could say we rest every day in Christ. So if uh, Calvin said we rest in the gospel um, and Christ said come to him, all those who are heavy and laden, his burden is easy and the yoke is light, then yeah, we rest every day in Christ. So you could say, and it does make sense to say every day is a Sabbath. Um, cause we rest in Christ. We rest in the gospel. Um, we, we don't need to do works to be saved. Uh, Christ has done that. It's finished. So we rest in Christ. We rest in his finished work of atonement and we rest in the gospel, which is his death and resurrection for sinners. Hopefully I've answered your question there. If anyone else have a question, far away. Comment in the uh, chat. All right. No problem, Peggy. All right, guys. Um, yeah, like I said, I encourage you to get a good commentary in the book of Hebrews because this will make you understand much better and much more beautiful how Christ is, how he has fulfilled it. Um, and the book of Galatians or the epistle to the Galatians kind of touches on this as well. Those in Galatia, the church in Galatia, uh, were false teachers came and said, you must do one more thing to be saved. You must be circumcised. And they're going back to the old covenant. And Paul said, if you've got to keep the law to be saved, then Christ made Christ died for no reason. Well, exactly. That's the problem. That's the thing. Okay. So um, I encourage you to get a pen and paper and uh, some commentaries, study light, uh, type in study light on Google, and you'll get many good commentaries. And you get a pen and paper. Uh, study the Word of God, and you'll see how amazing uh, how Christ has fulfilled basically everything in the Old Covenant, uh, in well, the ceremonies. Um, that it would be a vain thing to re to return to that, since Christ has fulfilled it. Um, so yeah, okay, guys. Uh, I guess that's it. Um, Thank you, guys. God bless. Thanks for listening and have a good day.